we say you're connected and then 15 minutes later you look like an idiot <laughs> not that I not that I don't always look like an idiot because I do but uh, let me see refreshing to see if we're in three two one and we're in hello everybody good morning good afternoon good night depending on the time of the day you're watching this because I don't know if you're watching it well actually Kelly Kelly so I just realized we are time traveling yes because you're nine nine hours later than me so actually this is not a YouTube show this is time traveling show but as I was saying I don't know if you're watching it live or in Spain, or Spain, or as we call it here, just so you know, Kelly Sue, we call it the zombie mode. That doesn't mean you're dead. That means oh. you're not watching it live. Oh, interesting. Okay. Stupid joke, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, aside of that, my public service announcement of the day, which is the same every day, preparing the microphone so you hear me well. <clears throat> Where's your fucking mask? Let me repeat. Where your fucking mask? And now why? The mask is not meant to protect you. It's to protect others from you. It can't protect you. That's, that's not the real point. The real point is we have to protect others. We have to protect our elders. We have to protect the children. And if anybody tells you the kids don't get COVID-19, that's a lie. They can and they can die. And it's not only about people dying. It's chronic illnesses. There's people who have really severe chronic illnesses, the lungs, the brains, Every other part of their body you can imagine. Eight months after getting the contagion. So please, be a good person, be human, be decent. Wear the mask. And last but not least, as I always say, if you think you're too important and you think your freedom is too important to wear a mask, and, and frankly, to care about any, uh, anybody else's safety and well-being, leave this fucking channel now. I don't want you here. After that, uh, hello, Kelly Sue. How are you? <laughs> David, how are you? Doing fine. How's things in your neck of the boots? Are things are getting uh, better, still crazy, or how is it? Yeah, I mean, um, the the I don't know if Portland made the international news, but um, you know, it it it, it was very exaggerated. Yeah. Uh, like it it the, 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 everyone here is so tickled by the whole like anarchist district. Uh, uh, in fact, I think David Walker um, is doing a, like a picture book mm -hmm. of uh, folk posters of like exploitation movies about the anarchist district of Portland, Oregon. But like Portland, Oregon is fine. Portland is safe. It's fine. Nothing is, we're not burning down. You, you could get a flat white coffee a block and a half from the protests during the fucking protests. Like, it's not, you know, it's, it was all very, very exaggerated. And uh, Antifa is not a thing to be afraid of. It's not, that's just yes. silly. Yes. Uh, that's, that's, that's how we saw it from this side, at least myself. Uh, everything looked like, okay, they're, they're trying to make a protest, uh, you know, like a really exaggerated and, uh, uh, a, a really exaggerated movie, you know, like an epic. And we were like, this is not the reality. And I was talking to Bendis and other people and they were telling me, no, that's not what's happening here. So, but it was so all at the same time, right? It was that, the, the uh, George Floyd's death, Black Lives Matter, the same, the COVID and all that. So it, it was, it, it all happened to you guys at the same time, right? Don't get me wrong. The protests were, were important. The protests were, were wildly important. And some of the ways that, not some of the ways, the ways that the police were reacting to the protests were inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like they should not have been gassing our citizens. That's insane. Yeah. Um, but this, this, the, the, the narrative that was making it to the national news that like, Portland was crazy town. No, people were in mourning and angry and they were showing up and expressing themselves in the way that they are supposed to yes. be able to do in a democracy. There was nothing inappropriate. In fact, the protests made me very proud of my city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so. What we saw here was, honestly, the reaction here was being scared for you guys because, you know, the orange chimpanzee started talking about sending national guard the military and all that yeah and we really were like the dictator wants to send the military to stop a legal fucking protest 
So yeah. for us, it was the escape part was that. The rest yeah. was like, well, people is protesting. Yeah, so what? No, it was that that was scary. And that was like the most un-American, you know, like like that that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's let's change the subject. Yeah. <laughs> um okay, so imagine I am the doctor. My name is Victor Frankenstein now. I just changed my name. Okay. I changed my into just a fucking road drink, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I just popped it into you and said, pandemic is over, you're free. So what's the first thing, the thing that you miss the most, you know, like, oh my God, I've been dying to do this for the last six months that you could die, that you could do first. That's the most boring answer in the entire world. I want to go to a thrift store. I just want to go to, do you have thrift stores? Do you know what a thrift store is? Yeah, what's so boring about it? Yeah, I just want to go to a thrift store. I that's, like, not, that's not boring. I love them. It's the best. It's like a <laughs> treasure hunt. That's why I say it's not boring. I love treasure hunts, you know, just, just <laughs> looking for things. And that suddenly, I remember in a thrift store in, in uh, Paris. In uh -huh. Africa, you know, by the same, there's a lot of them. And I was just going around and suddenly I found the first edition of Origins of Marvel Comics by Stan Lee. Oh my God. From 73. I don't know. So I was like, and the guy, I was like, well, he's going to charge me a lot of money. And it was like uh, five francs or something like that. Wow. So that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. I love it. I don't think it's boring at all. <laughs> the funny thing is that, like, my first reaction is not, like, wanting to go out and be with people. My first reaction is just, like, I want to go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> well, could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah. Um, uh, do you miss conventions at all? Or just like you know, it's good to have a break after so many years nonstop. Um, I miss the fact of conventions, but I don't. I I I, I didn't miss not having to do any traveling for mm -hmm. the last nine months. Uh, you know, it it did actually. It was a little bit nice to just have a. Like, nope, can't, not safe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, I, I do, I do love shows once I'm there. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I find them very invigorating, um, artistically, uh, socially. I'm, I, I enjoy them very much once I'm there. Mm -hmm. But the, the preparation for being able to go and the stress of travel and, you know, that's time you're not working and, you know, all of that is, uh, uh, I don't, I don't miss that part. Yeah. I, every time I get asked about by, by people, if I miss, you know, going to American conventions, my answer is you have to remember that for me it's eight hours or 18 hours, depending if I go New York or San Diego, West Coast or East Coast. So right. no, that part, no, I don't miss that part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, do you miss what is and what is the thing you miss the most about the convention itself? You know, the contact with the fans or that part that for me is the best. I was discussing it with Shaking the other day, which is you know, getting to dinner with, with colleagues and then suddenly somebody shows up that you didn't expect that you didn't see for the last three years and yeah. just start talking and it's and it's like you were talking yesterday. Yeah, um I I it would be hard for me to pick, to be honest, you know, because both of those things are, you know, the, being around other creators is always so inspiring. And it, you know, you, you have these conversations that you will remember and refer to years later because they make you start thinking about something that makes its way into your work, you know, or you're so impressed with somebody you start leveling up, you know, or, or, or something along those lines. But then there's mm -hmm. also the part where, you know, you get to be present for the people who are there to tell you what they have seen in your work and mm -hmm. how it resonated for them. Yeah. Um, and that's always powerful and informative, you know? Mm -hmm. There's also a part that I love that I've been discovering with all these conversations with, uh, it's been 130 in six months, especially with, with writers, which is that bit about you never know what a what a reader is going to get out of one of your stories. Yeah. You know, sometimes you expect you expect something, but more and more, even with the same story, 
doesn't matter. A different person is going to get a different thing out of it, which yeah. for you is gotta be absolutely crazy inspiring, right? And, and there's also that there's like, there's just stuff you can't see about your own work. There's a kind of mirror blindness Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I always enjoy Dragon Con because I, when I go to Dragon Con, I go usually as part of the academic mm -hmm. uh, section. And oh no, now you're, you're not a dude anymore. Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I always go as part of the academic thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll listen to like academic presentations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're really fascinating. And, and I will, it's always weird to go, it's not weird for me, but it's weird for the presenter. So I always feel weird. I, like I, I, I try to get permission. If I go to one that's about my own work, mm -hmm. um, I wanna make sure that the person presenting, uh, that my presence there doesn't make them uncomfortable or make them not feel like they can be critical, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but, uh, but regardless, like, it's always there's there's things about the work that you just can't see, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And at the same time, um, what is the part that makes you that made you decide of all the possibilities you had, you know, as a writer? Uh, comics is my my first love. This is what I want to do. It was by chance, or was something that what had always been in inside you. Um. I would love to say it was really deliberate, but it wasn't. Um, I, I have a, I have a theater degree, so I, I came mm -hmm. from live theater, and then, um, but I grew up on, on Air Force bases mm -hmm. overseas mostly, and, you know, I'm I'm old, so we didn't have American television, so. Um, so I read a lot of comic books, mm -hmm. you know? And so that was always a part of my vocabulary. It was always a part of my reading practice. Um, and I got involved with people who made comics first through, I think, like some social connections in New York, because that's where DC and Marvel were located at the time. And then uh, also through um, planetary fandom and the Warren Ellis posting yeah. board. Yeah. Um, and then I had communities, two communities and two intersecting communities around comic books that were just like a hobby that was not something I intended to pursue professionally. Mm -hmm. But I'm a, um, I'm a very social person and I'm a very competitive person, you know? And so, and like coming from theater, you know, there's that sort of like, you know, my dad's got a bar, let's put on a play, you know? And then like, the, there was that ethos around the, the Ellis forum that was like, you know, let's do an anthology and let's make mini comics. And, you know, and it was like, okay, cool. I can do that. Um, and so, so I just started doing it and I never, and it was kind of like that, that same gig, uh, uh, the, like gig attitude, gig culture um, that you have in New York because it's so damn expensive. You have mm -hmm. to have like 15 jobs, you know? Yeah. So it was just like, you know, yeah, I'll do that. And, and it was just kind of another thing. And then at some point, not, not on purpose, not with any great plan, but like somehow I sort of realized at some point, oh, this is now what I do. This is like, I haven't auditioned for anything or, you know, in years and years. And what I do is write comics. That's, that's how, that's what I do now, you mm -hmm. know? And I didn't, and, and I always hesitate to say it because it, it always makes me feel like, like it's somehow disrespectful mm -hmm. um, that I didn't find my way in with a real deliberateness, but I found my way in by doing what I loved and enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So I was following like my, my, 
my passion, but not in a way that was like, I never expected it to become my career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And the, when, when was the moment, if you, if you can recall it, if you remember it, what you said, I've made it. I am a comic writer. I'll let you know when that happens, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like I have broken into comics like more times than I can count, you know? I, I don't know. I don't know what. I, I did like notice at some point that like, oh, like I'm now I'm, I'm like kind of an elder and I don't know that, how that happened. I think there's just sort of like an age thing. Like, you know, I'm, I've got 20 years on a lot of the people on the panels with mm -hmm. me now and it's like, oh, Oh well, that's <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Remember what I always say: we are not old; we're vintage. There you go. Well, you know, and I'm trying. We're like the wine; we get better with time. That's right. That's right. And I, I am trying to uh, to accept aging with grace, and there are a great many wonderful things that come along with it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I think there are. It's it's a little bit loaded for women mm -hmm. um, because uh, uh, for incredibly obvious reasons that have been discussed to death, you know, yeah. but, okay. uh, uh, where we we sort of fear being erased or absolutely uh, uh, pushed back, yes. while, uh, and so that's that's a little weird. So trying to to navigate, you know, not denying your age or or to 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 accept it and everything that comes with it as a boon and like you know beating the hell out of the alternative, right? Um, yeah. But uh, uh, but then also like I. Uh, I still have things to say. I'm not done, you mm -hmm. know. But you don't, hopefully, you don't feel that I have to select my stories, the stories I want to tell very much because I don't know how much time I have left. You don't have that feeling yet, right? I do, actually. Um, but no, I, mean, no. <laughs> I do, but I don't, it's not a negative thing. Okay. I don't like it's a negative thing but there is some it was it happened a few years ago i realized at some point we it's true no matter what age you are yeah, but, but, it, but it becomes somehow more pertinent yes you're like oh i actually have a limited number of stories in me i have a limited number of books in me i don't know what that number is because i don't know how long i will live yeah um and so wanting to be again i'm going to go back to that word deliberate yeah. um in in my choice of what i do because it because i'm spending something of value i'm spending my time on this and so mm -hmm. i need to make sure that not only you know, early on, it was like, I have so much to learn that whatever I'm doing, I'm going to be learning. So just anything you have an interest in, go with it, you know? Mm -hmm. But now it's like, I mean, I still have so much to learn, don't get me wrong, but 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 it's a fine tuning kind of learning. Mm -hmm. It's the more, I, I know more of what I don't know. I know yeah. more about what I want to explore and what mm -hmm. I need to learn. Yeah. Um, and so trying to to kind of be selective and deliberate in all of that. But it's also part of the journey, right? I mean, you you get to be the person who can be deliberate, who can pick what you're going to do because of all the experience you have, you've accumulated, you've amassed. So it is it goes to a boiling point where the experience already tells you this is my path. Because if you didn't have it, you cannot choose a path, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And uh, in that path, what is the when you're writing? Let me let me say it this way: Do you use different muscles when you're doing create your own jobs or company jobs, or is the same ones just used in a different way? 
they're different, but I don't think they're different the way people think they're different. Mm -hmm. Most people, I don't know. Um, the way I hear it spoken about, you know, um, I, I think you should write everything like you own it. Mm -hmm. And I think you should be bold and write, you know, what feels urgent, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I never, I never take a corporate job and then I'm like, well, you know, you know, it, like, it, no, you, you write it like you own it. You write yeah. it like, like it, like this is your book, you yeah. know? And, um, and I think that's important, but there are some expectations of genre that you have to service there are expectations of genre that you have to service no matter what you're writing, but, but there are, you know, there, there are like certain house styles that you mm -hmm. have to work with. And, um, and I, and like, I don't, well, I don't think that editorial is as restrictive as the general public seems to think that uh, DC Marvel editorial is, that doesn't mean it's not restrictive. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, mean, you know, like it's not as bad as you think, and at the same time, you do get told no. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's limits. Uh, it's a corporate, so they have limits, and those limits they have uh, passed from the, from their bosses to them and from them to you. Yeah. That's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, what if I tell you um, we're talking about? Let's talk about comics storytelling. If I asked you, let's talk about music. Mm -hmm. If I asked you for you comics and storytelling or writing, whatever you prefer, or both, because the same thing in the end. Um, is it a symphony? Is it rock and roll or jazz to you? It depends on the book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, that's actually a really important part of my pitch process mm -hmm. or development process is figuring out what the book sounds like to me. Um, and so, uh, like, uh, uh, when I started, so, so like the, the, the obvious ones are, are like, uh, uh, Pretty Deadly is uh, Maricone. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bitch Planet is uh, Stax uh, Records Soul Music. Um, to me, it's very different soundtrack for Valentine, but for me, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 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 Captain Marvel is like Tom Petty. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, Avengers Assemble was like ACDC, it was like fun in and out, like three minute rock, right? Um, my early part of, of Aquaman was Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but then later it got more towards the ACDC like we as we got into Amnesty Bay and more interpersonal stuff it got got sort of more fun light like in and out stadium rock mm -hmm. um, but what ACDC bonus Scott's ACDC or the post bonus Scott ACDC because that's the important question yeah Okay, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so Back in Black is my favorite record. So, okay. um, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, I, but there is no, like, I will say this: there's no bad ACDC. No, I agree, I agree, yeah. I agree, I agree. Even with the records that people tells me, oh, this is a bad album. I'm like, I don't care. It's fun. I have fun with them. I enjoy them. I. It's ACDC. What do you expect? They're going to give you the fifth symphony or something? It's yeah. ACDC. It's just fun. And they've been doing fun for 40 years. Tell me about another band, you know, who's yeah. been able to do that. Yeah. Um, and talking about the music, but going back to the part yeah. when you are writing, yeah. do you need to... Let's, let's, okay, the tribute is there. Let me, let me go this to you. <laughs> There you go, ACDC, uh, uh, Tina Turner, Kiss, and Iron Maiden. There you go. Nothing to say, nothing bad to say about that. I, <laughs> like this. Um, I was saying, when you're writing, 
and I think music is a, part, a big part of your process. Do you need absolute silence? I mean, when you're crafting the story, the pitch, like, leave me alone. If I hear any sound, you're all dead. You know, I just take this baseball bat and start smashing you. Yeah. Or, yeah. or it depends on the part of the process. Um, no, I, I, I can listen to music, but it has to be music with no lyrics. Uh -huh. So I listen to a lot of classical music when I write. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard because like I, I know the most effective for me is the quiet, mm -hmm. but it's also uh, uh, the most uncomfortable. Yes. Um, uh, it's just something I'm sort of struggling with as I get older is the vulnerability that is required for the way that I write is sort of becoming harder and harder for me to access mm -hmm. as I age. Mm -hmm. uh, and like staying in touch with that vulnerability is becoming a more deliberate act. Mm -hmm. Does it happen to you when, that when you are in absolute silence around you? Let me let me explain why I say this. I am the fifth of five. So in my, in, in, you know, all kids, so all, all, all guys. And of course in my house, Silence didn't, didn't exist. There was always clattering. There was always noise. There was always cacophony. So now, if I try to work without sound, I always feel like this, you know, Jack Nicholson and The Shining is going to come behind <laughs> my back, you know, and stab me in the back, you know, something like that. Does that happen to you, that the absolute silence makes you uncomfortable and you need, like, any kind of noise? So I'm an only child, right? So, uh, So I'm not... So, so I'm, silence isn't foreign to me. And, and actually my, my husband is an only child as well. So we have two children and when our children bicker, we're like completely confused by it. We're like, but you love each other. You should be nice. Like I always wanted a sibling. Why do you not, you know, like they're, then they're like, Bleh. you know, but. Um, <laughs> Imagine being the fifth of five. An oh old, my God. An, an old man. That's my case. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it, so it's it's not um it's it's i guess i'm the, the most honest answer is in silence i can hear my own thoughts the most and sometimes that's overwhelming uh-huh uh-huh so sometimes you need some sound to just calm, calm quiet down thoughts. a little bit yeah uh I was talking to when I was talking to Greg Raka, you know, some um, some weeks ago. He told me a story about when he was writing. I think it was the second uh, Atticus Kodiak, you know, book, oh. and and how when he was finished, when he just had just finished the second arc, you know, he started to, to to do the third arc, you know, the finish, the ending, and the characters started arguing at him, telling him, "No, you're wrong. This is the wrong path," and he struggled for a month trying to. Of course, between brackets, Greg is not crazy. <laughs> between brackets, trying to convince the characters, you know, to go his way. Yeah. He couldn't until he agreed to his with his characters and said, "Okay, you know what? Let's do it another way." He couldn't finish. That has that happened to you at all? Absolutely. Um, and it's the weirdest, in particular, because I I am not an especially emotionally driven person. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm a little bit, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, come from an Italian American family. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, uh effusive, like, yes, you know, yes, I'm, yes, I'm yes, very yes. animated, yeah. but, um, but I'm not like, I, I don't, I don't cry. I don't get sad. Um, uh, I get mad occasionally, but I'm not. I'm not prone to depression. I'm not. Um, uh, you know, I, I also I'm not good at like. I don't especially look forward to things. I'm sort of very practically in the moment. You know, um, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not an emotionally led human. Mm -hmm. um, in my day-to-day -day functioning. I'm a very uh, intellectually led human. 
but in my writing, I write very intuitively. It's very, I have a very hard time with outlines mm -hmm. because I will write the outline and I think everything makes sense and this is all very logical and very math and it all works. And then I go to write it and then the human beings that I'm writing are like, no, fuck you, that's a lie, you know? <laughs> and like, and you sound like a crazy person when you say that, but it, it's it's just that when you're you're working and you're trying, when you're trying to make something go in a pl in a direction that isn't that capital T truth, mm -hmm. it, they just won't. You know it's a lie, and you can't do it. And on some level, the the characters are just sit down and they're like, "All right." Until you are ready to let us speak our truth, we're not doing shit for you. Yeah. Um, and 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 that's hard. Uh, and it's weird. And 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 it's very difficult to talk about without sounding like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's mystical. I don't think it's magic. I don't. I, I think the language that we have to use to talk about it makes it sound much mo more esoteric than it actually is. I think um, it, it, it simply is that you are accessing a part of yourself where you understand human motivations better than your um, executive functions Absolutely. tend to uh, understand human motivations. So it's, it's the same way that like, Econ um, uh, uh, economists are always frustrated because human beings will act against their own interests, right? So when you're doing that outline with your prefrontal cortex and you're like, yes, this all makes sense and this is in their interests and this is what they would do. And then you go to write it and you're writing using more of this like lizard brain amygdala stuff. Yes. Amygdala says, I know that that is in my best interest, but I'm telling you as a fucking human being, I'm running screaming from that, right? Um, and that's, I think, where you are in this process is you are dancing between those two parts of the brain. It's not magic, it's not shamanism, it's not channeling you know, anything, it's just working with those two impulses of being a human being. Yeah, but that's also, um, I always say when, when I discuss this with uh, with other writers, I always say, uh, you talk about it, it not being mystical. So I completely agree. I always say two things. First, I go and quote Arthur C. Clarke when he said, magic is the science we still don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, it's just a process that is there. And also that I always say that in uh, back in the day, the schools were called arts and sciences for a reason. They yeah. were a lot more intermingled that people think, so, you know, I am oh, I am a guy, I am letters, I am not math, I'm not science. Yeah. And I always remember say, but it should be in the middle. No, it's- Because it's, writing is a science. If you don't- have, music, right? Exactly, exactly, no. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. What music is, you go back to Bach, Beethoven and the others, and you see it was all math, it's all, it's so precision. And that's why I think comics are really close to music. Yeah. As, as I said before, rock and roll, uh, you know. No, and like, I mean, it's what we do in comic. All right, so storytelling is puzzle solving. And comics are a an equation where we we take time and we translate it into space. Yes. Right? So we make we, we take time and we make it visible as a thing that takes up space on a page. And then we create visual rhythm so that when you're looking at that page, you could clap out the rhythm of the page. And that rhythm then is just like with music, it's, it's mirrored in sort of your heartbeat. And yep. like, you know, this series of small panels, like builds, it's a series of small panels builds and then large panel. Yes. And has that has both a it has a visual rhythm it has an it's something it like it then 
translates in the brain to an auditory rhythm and it has an emotional rhythm too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think that that's, that's why we love comics, right? It's like, oh, it's not, people dismiss it as this, like, oh, it's, you know, it's for, it's for kids. And like, it can be for kids and it can be for adults, but you know what it's not? It's not simple. It's not stupid. No. It's really complicated and beautiful and magical. And like everything in that story, it actually takes place in your brain. Mm -hmm. like, the story doesn't happen on the page. The, what happens on the page is the cues to trigger the story in your brain. Come on. How do you not fucking love that? How and do you not fucking love that? It, and it's also the second part of it where I always say why I think that comics language should be teach, should be taught from a very young age. Because I always say us, as readers, as professionals, we have a superpower. And let me explain what I mean. You get a comic, and of course, we know. Superman does this. The next thing is not he opens it, he runs. No, the next thing is we see we see Superman flying. Yeah. And we add all the pieces. And we are so used to read and cover what's between the panels that as comic readers, let me see, let me know if you agree or not. When we read a newspaper or we watch the news or we watch a movie, we always, always, always never take anything for granted. We are always thinking about what's behind it. And that's something that is taught to us because we read comics, because yeah. that teaches us always to look behind, what's behind the curtain. Yeah. What do you think about that? And that, that's why I think comics should be teach from a very young age, because I think they teach people to be more assertive or to be more looking, look at things in depth. Yeah. You know, I think um, because it's 2020, um, uh, like I, I, like every other human being, uh, uh, I'm like, I should have a podcast, right? You know, because we're, we're all like, well, I think I think everyone has a podcast now, right? Like, Swish, I should do a podcast. But all the ideas that I have for podcasts are like completely not commercial whatsoever, right? But um, but the other day I, I was I was like, uh, 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 oh, I, I, I have like a, I want to, I have an idea for a podcast. And one of the ideas I had for a podcast that no one but you, like you and me would listen to is um, uh, uh, more real than real to mm -hmm. talk to different artists that work in the kinds of storytelling that is uh, like like Commedia dell'arte, yeah. like uh, like Shakespeare, like melodrama, like theater of the absurd. Uh, like um, in some some circus arts, mm -hmm. like things that are and 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 comics, some of the comic genre work, like things that are that that shortcut to really essential truths using these larger, exaggerated, not real forms. Yeah. Right. So it's like more real than real. Anyway. Uh, no one would listen to this podcast. I'm not doing it. But um, I would. Like, okay, yes. <laughs> two, two listeners. One of them knows. Um, but but you know what I mean? Like that. Like that is something that is a very much of interest to me. And I think comics. I mean, comics are. A, a comics are a medium that can be used to do realistic uh, work as well. Absolutely. But. Um, but I think the way we tend to use comics more often puts comics right in there with, uh, uh, you know, Greek theater and all of the other examples that I just gave that are like sort of essence uh, 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 boiling down to essentials and getting into real human truths through that. So the, uh, and uh, talking about that, how important it is for you as a writer or as a reader? Uh, pattern recognition and we talk about that lizard brain you know yeah. I always say that a big part of some comics mostly in the 90s but uh, happens sometimes now is that they don't realize that you need to give the reader space you know suggest in terms instead of giving them all the full information because 
you are uh, you are a creator and a manipulator, of course, because you are a creator. But at the same time, comics, I think, is the art that needs more participation from the reader. Yeah, you can't be passive, or you are not going to like the comic. So you gotta give them some space, and that's why I was asking about pattern recognition. How is important? How important is for you to use it in uh, your stories? I think wildly important, and wildly important to me as a human being. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think we're always using art to connect us to ourselves and to other human beings and so there has to be there has to be both signposts and space for you to have that conversation yeah you know um uh because i mean i don't it's i'm not interested in and and I have to be careful here. When I say I am not interested in, that doesn't mean I don't think it should exist. That doesn't mean I'm trying to police what comics can get made. Yeah. I'm not. Make all of the comics. I don't care. It's fine. I'm not telling you what comics to make. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm telling, I am making the comics I'm interested in. Yeah. You make the comics you're interested in and we'll all get along great, right? Um, but, uh, I am personally not interested in comics that are, are just sort of, you know, colors and, and shapes moving across pages and shit blowing up that doesn't have a point of view and something to say yeah. about a larger humanity. Yes. Um, and that's just me. I mean, it's not just me, but you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's, it's okay. I'm not saying that those comics can't exist. Although I would say that a lot of comics that think they are not making any sort of statement are, but mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But by the end of the day, it's all about the human experience, right? It's ma many times I hear people trying, I try to distance myself from my writing as much as I can. And my answer is, but you can't. You can't. No. You. It's, it's always going to be imbued with your personality. Either, the only way to do that is if you suffer amnesia, you know, every time before you start writing. Because yeah. it's always going to be about you. And they're like, well, no, yes, it's always about you. You are the writer. It's your creature. Whether it's corporate or creator owned, it's your creature. It's got to be a, yeah. a big part of you is going to be there, right? And and then there's that the, the like, super magic alchemy of collaboration absolutely right? where um where that the you know the model that we work in mostly which is the 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 writer artist model the work becomes a conversation yes you know and the tenor of that conversation is very specific to those two people mm -hmm. so so you can, you know, you like, you could say like my work, you know, Kelly Pseudoconics work is about this, but, but Kelly Pseudoconics work that she does with Emma Rios mm -hmm. is very distinct and very different than Kelly Pseudoconics work that she does with Phil Jimenez, mm -hmm. with Valentine Delandro, because, because it's a, it's not just Kelly Sudeconic's work because it's also Emma Rios's work. Yes. It's also Phil Jimenez's work and 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 Val Delandra's work, and they are bringing their DNA and their emotional interpretations and their Jungian archetypes and you know and everything else to this conversation, and it becomes this the, the piece that you produce, the story that you produce, is a conversation. Yes. Um. And I I love and cherish that um you know i always say if i want to be a god i'll write a novel mm -hmm. which you know I, I i would like to do at some point i'm working on a novel right now actually greg rucka is is coaching me through writing my novel um and it's an interesting process it's not a conversation or rather it's a conversation with myself mm -hmm. um it's very different um but the kind of collaborative work that we do in theater, the kind of collaborative work that we do in comics, isn't about just the conversation you have with yourself. It's about mm -hmm. the way you see yourself in your partner, 
the way that you, the things that are important to them, the way you react to the things that are important to them. It's just all this. Yeah. It's beautiful. And, you know? and with a novel, it is, it's something internal. But when you're doing comics, I always say that by the end of the day, one person, other person, start working until it gets to a point where you guys create a third person, which is the yeah. final creator. It's not, there is not, there is not uh, Kelly and Emma or Kelly and Bao or Kelly and Phil. It's that third entity you've created, yeah. nameless, doesn't matter, but that's the real creator of the piece, right? Yes, and, and it gets really cool too because it gets to the point where you're like, I, I don't know who did what, like where you don't remember, yeah. like, where something came from, you know, or like you have that embarrassing moment where you you like compliment somebody on something and you're like, that was really great. And they're like, yeah, you you put that in the script, you know, or, or what like but but it doesn't feel like yours because it's been executed in such a way that you never like imagined. And so it's this other thing that you didn't recognize as being part of your process, you know? Um and just the whole thing is like, Emma is really good at articulating how what folly it is to try and separate. Well, the writer did this and the artist did this. And like, no, authorship belongs to both people in this conversation. Absolutely. And none of them, like everything is a reaction to the other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you get one writer who doesn't write for his or her artist, you notice it in one second. As uh, I always say, when when I'm, when one of the artists I work with, when the writer doesn't care, or the other way around, when the artist doesn't care about what the writer is putting on, it's like that's a bad comic. It's impossible. It's not. It's never going to work. If there's no yeah. synergy, it's not a comic. It's something else. I don't know what it is, but it's not a comic, right? No, it it just lacks joy, and that's always that's like I I have a. Like I, I will not write if and and when they if I, if we don't know who the artist is, I'm not writing. Yeah. Um, because how could I? What's the you know? I can't write a generic script. A comic script is a letter to the artist. Yes, absolutely. It's not a. It's very different than like a theatrical script is general a theatrical script is meant to be interpreted by as many teams as possible over years right mm -hmm. but a comic script is a personal letter that you should be playing into the strengths and interests of your partner yes um and it, and so so this uh, the idea of like you know can you just write the script and then we'll and then we'll find an artist for it? Is like no, I can't. Uh, no, because you also don't know what that 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 artist's uh, forte's strengths or what they don't like to do or what to challenge them with, them with. Because in many cases, you know, artists love to be challenged. Yeah, and you don't you don't know how to, well, it's going to be boring for the artist because you're having to write something generic because you are not writing for them. Yeah. Yeah, and it and it just it, it's 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 foolishness. I don't like it. Um, uh, it, it it you end up with this thing that's kind of bloodless, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. And I and I uh, I don't like it. I think it's disrespectful. Absolutely. Uh, how much? Maybe this is a weird question, but how much do you learn about yourself when you get the art back for, from every comic? about the parts that you have put in there, but you didn't realize were important to you? Um, so this will be interesting. So I do not have a visual imagination. Mm -hmm. That is very hard for people to understand who do have visual imaginations. So um, uh, it, it also, it makes me a weird choice for a comic writer, but also it makes me a hell of a collaborator. Mm -hmm. Because there's never going to be a time where I'm like, well, that's not how I pictured it because I didn't picture it, you know? Um, so until, you know, I don't know what the character looks like until the artist draws them. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh, that's what, well, nice to meet you. You know, like, um, 
so, so there's a, there's so much that I learn about the stories and the characters when the art comes in. And it's one of the reasons that like the, my creator owned work, we tend to work in shorter chunks than in full scripts because so much because that allows for that conversation it's it's riskier because yeah. it's harder you don't get like the artist doesn't have as much information but um but the 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 conversation flows better because i learn so much from what comes in and i'm able to shift in response to it so it's much more dynamic mm -hmm. in the collaborative aspect you know yeah that's what i was going to say that it's risky but at the same time it allows you to create a real story based on it because I do call it a conversation, but I call it again synergy. Is that yeah. or serendipity, if you want to call it like that? You don't expect something, and suddenly you see it on the page, and you're like, "Oh, that thing I, I, I have given this much thought about now is this bigger?" Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'm so I, you know I'm so interested in. Like and, and uh, like uh, 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 Miguel Mendoza uh, mm -hmm. that I worked with uh, on the end of the Aquaman run. Um, I this is one of those things where I don't know if it was him or me, you know. But like, I had I had this notion about Princess Andy about the baby that the baby was kind of was was like fearless and mm -hmm. voracious that like being raised in this place in the world where they're like literally protected by gods and superheroes there's just no fear at all right because like they just cannot get into peril mm -hmm. and so this sort of like like real like taking on of the world and like just just this voraciousness but um miguel drew baby girl with her sippy cup and there's just this one panel where she's got the sippy cup and she's like looking to the side and it's the most like that moment that panel taught me everything i needed to know about that child mm -hmm. you know and like and the woman that that child would be, you know? Um, and, it, and it was all in that execution that uh, that was like, oh, she's like super focused on this thing, but like also I need to see everything, you know? Um, and it's just, it's just magical. And that changed everything. And then there's another one in, in Aquaman with uh, um, uh, Robeson, uh, uh, Robson Horka. I'm working on it. Rocha. Uh, Rocha. Rocha. Okay. Um, uh, he drew this kid uh, and he had um, he had uh, uh, cargo shorts on and the, and the cargo shorts like clearly were full of, like the pocket in the cargo shorts were full of stuff, mm -hmm. right? That is totally not in the script. Cargo shorts are not in the script. And then, and then, and then I looked at that and I thought, like, oh my God, what's in those pockets? And I was like, oh well, seashells and sticks and an old match car and his EpiPen. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I was like, oh, that kid's got an allergy. You know, and it was just like all of this stuff that I didn't know about that kid until I saw those pocket stuff, right? And like if I had kept going in on Aquaman, I would have come back to the story where that kid got into something and that EpiPen had to be used, mm -hmm. you know? I never I never got there because I just didn't have time. But like all of those details, all, that all came out of the art. That came out of the way that he drew that little boy who of course stuffed the pockets in his shorts. But I didn't think about that, you know? So. Well, at the same time, which is, 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 uh, is a lot of fun, 
when you realize, you know, uh, Janik was telling me and uh, Bean uh, quietly was telling me the same thing, that sometimes they just draw things for the sake of it, you know, to, to have fun. And yeah. then every time Grant gets the script, says this is dangerous because uh, Janik told me that one scene in Batman Inc, I think it was, he just drew a fish just for yeah. fun. And then Grant created a, sto a story out of that fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, what I, didn't, you know, I, I didn't think it was important. It was just a joke. It's like, but it, whatever thing it you can you guys can get as writers is just it just can flame your imagination, right? Even if it's yeah. the smallest thing for the artist. Yeah, that's the dialogue. That's the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's what makes us special. When you're pitching, what what in instinctively, what goes first for you? Is structure or emotion? Emotion. Um, and again. I, I hate to say it because it's very unnatural for me as a human being, but I'm I'm in as a human being, I'm 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 checklists and organization and structure and that's my day-to-day -day life. But mm -hmm. as a writer, it's uh it, it's this is what this is a story about, or uh I the, you know, the sweater thread, the thing that's the way into the story can be any little thing, you know, it, 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 it might be, it, it might be like, you know, to just like a moment of a conversation. It might be a particular image. It might be a particular feeling, you know, whatever it is. There's, I mean, there are things that I use with the things that are more structured that I use with superheroes in particular. Like we talked before, um, I mean, you and I, but I, I, I've spoken before about um, the way I, I try to find into superheroes in that particular genre is I'm always trying to, and this, I, I actually got this from my husband. My husband first articulated this, but um, that trying to connect their gift mm -hmm. to their wound. Mm -hmm. So like the wound becomes the engine that pushes the story forward. And then like to make that kind of have a, a certain poetry, you want to connect the wound to the gift, right? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, now you have an engine that will power a thousand stories. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and the, the characters that do that the most beautifully, the most simply, the most poetically are the ones that are the most iconic. Yeah. Um, uh, and so like when I was, working on um, uh, Aquaman was my most recent book. So it's the one I keep bringing up. I'm sorry about that. But um, mm -hmm. uh, when I was working on Aquaman, um, the notion, I was, I was sort of trying to figure out, all right, what's his core wound? Mm -hmm. And there's been different interpretations over the years where they have different ones, you know, and in, in the, beginning it was kind of the same as superman it was like this man without a home right like he's he is not he's neither human nor atlantean right and so but the the problem with that in a contemporary context is he he pays no price for being atlantean He's handsome and bulletproof and on the Justice League. So mm -hmm. you can't you can't argue that there's a wound that he's paying a price for not being human in stories that are told. Um, it would work if you're doing Atlanta stories, but it doesn't work if you're doing stories set in our world mm -hmm. because there's no price for it. And so it was like, okay, well then, then what do we look at? And I'm I'm researching Johns's run in particular because it was uh, like so successful. And there's this moment in Johns's run. Well, there's one that I dismissed, which was like you know, okay, he kills Manta's father, right? And that's that's guilt. That's an incredible core wound, but it's so dark. And I I tend to think of Aquaman as a as an upward facing character, mm -hmm. as a kind of blue sky character. So it's like, I don't want his core wound to be something that's as dark as, well, he's a murderer, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, uh, so I, there's this moment as a child when his father takes him to the shore to like look for his mother, right? 
And it was like, okay, abandonment. Mm -hmm. That's a core wound, right? So, um, uh, and then, so what does that give me for him as a human being? Well, it gives me someone who's always trying to prove to the absent parent that they made a mistake, that they were worth it, right? So it gives me an overachiever. It gives, you know, like all of these things that are like, oh, that works, that works, that works. And then can I connect it to his gift? Yes, he can call every creature in the ocean back to him except his mother. Ouch. Perfect. Yes. Right? Now I have an engine that can power a thousand stories. Mm -hmm. That is also why I never wrote his mother. I get asked like, why didn't you write Atlanta? And like, because for my purposes with the engine that I am working with, it is more powerful for her to be absent. Yeah, that. the moment you write the you write her or include her in the story, you make her real. So it's less painful. Yes, if he heals, I don't have an engine anymore. There you go, there you so. go. But and also you're dealing with archetypes, you know, when you are talking about superheroes uh, and archetypes need need uh, this. We can go back to Joseph Campbell, you know, and the hero's journey and all that. But by the end of the day, there's some archetypes you have to follow, and one of them, as you said, is they have they have to have an injury is not the word, but you know what I mean. They have to have something painful inside them that drives them forward. And you said iconic, and of course we are going to talk about. You have Batman, they kill his parents. You have uh, Spider Man. Uncle Ben was killed because of his of his failings. So and those are the, probably the two the two more iconic superheroes there is. And I believe, I agree with you. I think that's the reason. There's always some guilt that drives them forward and makes them more relatable to us, right? Yeah. And so for like when I was working with Carol, um, yeah. the wound that I chose for Carol was uh, there's this moment in uh, in her it's in Claremont Claremont's run where um, her father won't pay for her to go to school because she's a, a woman and so she's probably just gonna get married anyway and he's not, he's a construction foreman and he's got two sons, so he's gonna pay for them to go to school. She joins the Air Force in order to get her school paid for, right? And so her core wound is trying to prove to this, this, patriarch this father figure that she loves and adores that she is as worthy as her brothers right and so everything uh, is about proving herself everything is about pushing further and you know and that's where higher further faster comes from is like always trying to excel it's never enough yes. nothing that she can do is ever going to be enough because she can never prove to her dead father that she mattered absolutely you know i have uh family experiences with that when i saw something really close to me somebody very close to me that of course there was boys and girls in the family boys could do whatever they wanted girls had to clean the dishes yeah they they were they were going to get all the money they wanted and go back home at any time of the day they want they had to well women had to be back at, at eight ten they couldn't right. go out. They had to blah, blah, blah. And I had a conversation with one of those people really close to me, as I said, when my answer was always the same. is you are never going to make it to the point where you get that respect you're, you're trying to achieve because yeah. that person is not built that way. Yeah. It's sad to say it, but you're working about against many centuries. Yeah. And we have to look uh, to the farther generations. I always say that, that you know, Try to let's look forward. Let's think about the future. This is what we can. That's what we can change, right? Or find that validation inside, right? There you go. Absolutely. It's the hardest part. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for you, um, did you think in a more linear way, or when you're writing, you know, the story starts here and goes there, or you th or you do, you make time 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 and space jumps when you're when you're designing a story. No, I think my natural inclination is linear. Um, my, I, I envy my husband, and uh, it's in case I know you know this, but it, uh, um, I, so I'm married to the uh, comic book writer uh, Matt Fraction, um, who's a goddamn genius, which is really irritating. Um, you both are. Stop. Uh, he's so good. He's so good. Um, but he his brain 
works in such a way that he almost he'll, he sees the story like in bullet time, mm -hmm. you know, like the way like in the Matrix where you can just like like he can see the story like that, um, and and he can tell stories like that, and he uses very interesting structures like in in hawkeye in november most i think i think the, the most essentially in those mm -hmm. two books but kind of in everything he does there's like he's almost incapable of telling a like straight down the middle story you know um and uh i just don't it is not natural for me to because i don't approach it from structure mm -hmm. first structure is such a natural language for him and whereas i write so intuitively that you know it doesn't I can't, I couldn't work in such a complicated structure because then what if I got in there and was like, but that doesn't mm -hmm. feel right. Now I have to tear apart the whole structure, you know? Um, and he can manage to do both. Like he can write very human, very vulnerable, emotional truths, but in these complicated structures and then make those complicated structures feel mm -hmm. effortless which is just like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> and and uh, in case you, you guys haven't read it, Jimmy Olsen by uh, by, oh by Matt God. and Steve Lieber is the best book of last year by far. I, I mean, for me at least. Kill me if you don't agree. I don't care. It's fucking genius. That whole book from those, those and I believe Steve is also a genius. So Steve and Matt together is like, oh, yeah. boom. E easily, easily. And, and, it, and it's, and there's something it's kind of it's, it's a little bit like with sex criminals too right like it's a stupid joke it should not be as smart as it is it has no right to be as smart as it is either one of those books and they're both brilliant yes. with jimmy i gotta say when i started reading it the first thing i said after i finished the first issue was this shouldn't work but my yeah. man he does yeah no, it's anyway, I'm so saying I think that even if you if you don't see it now, that instinctively you do it. You are not linear. And let me say let me say what I why I mean that. I always say these guys, I know I'm sorry, and I'm going to repeat it. I think that like, we go back to science and, and comics and music and all that and storytelling. I think comics is the only art form that can defy Einstein's theory of relativity. No other one that can, because either if you think about it or not, you know, arrow of time. Einstein said it can only go forward. Not in comics. Right. It has to go forward yeah. in movies. Yes. In novels. Yes. You see a flashback. It's sharing because it cuts the flow. You don't need the flow in comics. Right. You can just go back, forth, say 20 pages. Okay, I'm going to just do this whole comic. It's going to happen at the same moment. Or yeah. I'm going to go back and forth. Yeah. So for you, it's natural as a comic writer to do it, right? Yeah. There's, there's also, there's like interesting things about how, like, uh, like we don't, we, we don't take in when you turn that page and this is a different thing when you, when you're reading digitally, but when you, when you, when you turn the page, yes, you're going to read like this, but when you turn that page, you see the whole spread. So your first moment of consumption, you take in the whole thing viscerally all at once. So nothing you read here is a surprise, really, once the page is turned. You know, and so that's a sort of squishy thing that you're doing with mm -hmm. time, too. That's very interesting. And you know, on the most basic level, as a creator, you must think very deliberately and very carefully about those page turns. Um, and I have a really hard time. It's another thing that my, my husband is very good at, but I'm, it's a simple thing, but I have a very hard time changing mm -hmm. scenes 
in the middle of a page. I really like to change scenes after the page after the page turn. Yeah, either after page turn or at least at the top of the mm -hmm. page. Um, now I can do it if like I'm comfortable with it if like we're seeing we're seeing you know something happening here at the same time something's happening here at the same time something's happening here like that's fine that's comfortable but if we're like actually just sort of linearly telling the story but I choose to change the scene in the middle of a page I can do it but if I'm going to do it I have to do it with a match cut I have to do it with something that is some kind of additional mm -hmm. linkage otherwise it feels wildly unnatural. No, no, it makes perfect sense. Uh and how deliberate are you with the with the page turns then? You're deliberate, or for you yeah. it's uh, instinctive to see how a page is gonna finish with that cliffhanger for the next page? No, very, very deliberate with page turns. Very deliberate with page turns. And also frequently I find that actually. I need one more panel at the bottom of the page than I think I need because there's the moment, but then I think you also need a half breath after uh -huh. the moment. Uh, and I think that's been a thing that is like taken me a long time to learn that you need the, like you see the thing, but then you also see their eyes uh -huh. come up, you know, and then, and that that's that like half breath you need before like okay now new thing right you know how important is for you um silence as a narrative tool so <laughs> important and it's the thing that comics does but so so you, you you say comics uh uh breaks time and space right and i and i agree with you but i also think so a moment of stillness, yes. right? Okay, a moment of stillness, there is nothing, nothing can do stillness. Like we can do stillness. So if I, if I show you, oh, this, I get very excited about this. So um, uh, if we're watching a movie and we're just watching someone sit there, right? We hear them breathe. We see them breathe. And the, the more still it is, the more we're drawn to all of those little movements and little sounds, right? Those become emphasized because of the lack of anything else, right? So that, that stillness is very active and very full and not really mm -hmm. still, okay? A book can't do it at all. A prose book? can't do stillness because it, it because you're moving in the prose and and the only way they would be able to do it is at that blank space at the end mm -hmm. of a page they can sort of do it they can sort of do stillness in that blank page that they'll put before the chapter turn mm -hmm. right sort of but eh. uh, i don't think they can to be honest but you know <laughs> no uh, so I think the only other medium that can come close to doing what we can do is poetry. Poetry can get close, but in comics, I can show you, well, I can't, but me and my collaborative partner can show you four panels where nothing changes but the light. And that is profound stillness that is kind of that is a stillness that is deeper quieter more alone it, it's it can be full of lights and it can be pitch black in yeah. it like in the profound insulation of that moment yeah. you know yeah um, and I also put, uh, let me know if you agree, the, the example of, you know, you get a, to say something like a bottle like this of glass, and you just put it like this in a panel, you don't say anything. And the next panel is like this, you know, drawing some liquor or whatever kind. It's telling you a story. Yeah. 
yeah telling absolutely. you how tired or drunk that person is or he's or she's alone and that co only can only comics can do that with absolute silence they're telling you the whole story of how that person is feeling how how yeah. you know his person or her personality are uh the silence is a value that in many cases i see that people doesn't use in comics to their advantage because for me it's fundamental with capital yeah. letters Absolutely. I do think that sometimes, so I, I have a test for everything that I, bec because when we are making comics, we only have 22 pages or 24 pages or you know, 20 pages, 20, 24 pages, let's say in a, um, in a, in a, in a, one of these, right? Yep. Whether you call it a floppy or a pamphlet or whatever you want to call it. Um, we have 20 to 24 pages to take someone on a full ride right? We need to give them an, an, an entire emotional experience in just those, those 20 to 24 pages. That is a tall order. Yeah. So, um, so it requires discipline in order to execute that. And so what you have to do is um, you have to kind of force yourself to justify everything you put on the page. So everything you put on the page has to either push our plot forward or tell us something that we must know about character. Yeah. Ideally, it does both of those things. The, the exception I will make to that, and I, I very seldom do I do this, but every once in a while, I will add a balloon that doesn't really need to be there. Mm -hmm because I'm trying to force the eye uh -huh. to come to a particular place because there's something on the page that I'm afraid is going to be missed, or I think that the rhythm is off and we need to make sure that we've corrected for it. And that's the only time. And then when I do do that, I try then to, to justify it. Like, okay, now I have to put this, this balloon there what is information that I can put that's going to to take that's that is going to be vital that'll maybe ah. free me up somewhere else? Yeah, if you add that balloon to something that was otherwise uh, silent, you need to be something that matters, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but if you can do, I mean, like the perfect comic would be silent. The mm -hmm. perfect comic would be. Uh, uh, it would be executed such that the visuals were so perfect, you didn't need balloons to guide the eye. And the story was told so visually that you didn't need the exposition, the shortcuts that come in dialogue um, in, in order to elicit the connection and emotional response that you're looking for. Yeah, I always say that uh, the comics as a kid, the comics that really teach me, taught me how comics work, and to and to understand the storytelling was uh, Larry Hammer's GI Joe. That the issue that he did was silent. I, I don't know if you've read it, but he he did a completely silent GI Joe issue, and that changed things for many people, including myself, because that uh, the is completely silent. The issue and he told me so much about storytelling. Yeah, and Larry oh, was at the same but, time the writer, yeah. the artist, and the editor of that book. Yeah, so that was really important. That was really special. Um, one last question for me, and then we go to the guys so they don't kill me. Okay. <laughs> what is more important for you, the journey or the destination? The journey. Yes. yes. Happy yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, hands down. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you need to know where you're going, but I think the important part is how you get there. Um, yeah, and in your and in your case, as you said before, if you give chunks to Emma or to Bal or to Phil or any or Robson or any of the others, David Lopez. David hello. Lopez, who's here? He just said hello, hello, David. Uh, ah. So oh, if you give it, if you if you give it those chunks, so they come back and change your mind about the story and you adapt the story. Of course, that's the journey, right? Even if yeah. you know the destination, the journey is going to change. Yeah, 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 and it, and it's. That's where the discovery is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that for me is the joy of writing is in the discovery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let's go with people. Uh, okay.
Carolina Bensler, hi, hello, how are you? Wanna become famous? No, that's spam. Uh, Blake Roybal, <laughs> what comic book have you read the most? I guess he means how, what comic book have you read most times? Planetary. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now you now you're gonna have now you have to work with John Cassidy. <laughs> so, uh, let me see. Hi Kelly, La Atlantida de Seita. La Atlantida. Okay. I think you you like Aquaman. <laughs> Hi Kelly Sue. Thank you very much for your fantastic work in Aquaman. I have two questions. If you continue with Aquaman, what future would you like Andy Andy Curry to have? Also, is Mera your favorite superhero? Uh, I love Mara, but no, she's she's not my favorite superhero. I think my favorite superhero is Lois Lane, who is not a superhero. Um, but uh, uh, sh Lois Lane is a journalist uh, and a and a truth teller, and those are are that those are my personal heroes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I, but I I I love Mara. Um, Mara's fantastic. Um, and I have a whole, like, I have a whole thing about, I got like, when in, in spoilers, spoilers, <laughs> in, uh, uh, in our run, um, Mara gets angry at, um, because of his core wounds, and because of like a lot of fear around being a parent, um, uh, Arthur, when he finds out that, that Mara is pregnant is like, okay, I need to go think about this. And she's like, no, you need to stay here and man the fuck up basically. Yeah. And, uh, and I hate that phrase, but, um, and, uh, and then he's like, no, for real, I, I really just need a minute. And they, they, they fight and she gets super angry and, she ends up killing him in a, you know, inadvertently just because she's so rage filled. And it was like, you know, oh, DeConnick wrote this thing where it's like, she's hormonal and like, it has nothing to do with her pregnant. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with her hormones. It, she is a character who is established, previously established, like a dude touches her in the grocery store and she breaks his fucking arm. Like she's a quick temper. She is like, yeah. like, that now imagine the dude for whom she has given up literally everything in the world. She tells him, I am in this really vulnerable moment, vulnerable moment. And he's like, yeah, I need a minute. And she's like, fuck, no, you do not. She loses her shit. It's not about her being hormonal. It's about her being Mara. And like Mara is quick tempered and violent. I'm sorry. It's there. You know, and I actually kind of fucking love her for that. And when there's that moment where like, like, like they're talking to her about having broken the guy's arm and she's like, yeah, he touched me. Like, I was not wrong. I do not regret it. You touch me and I'll break your fucking arm too. You know, like, anyway, that's my whole, like, I don't like this thing where it's like, you know, Mara's a softy and she would never do that. Like bullshit. Have you read any of Mara? No, not at all. That was absolutely true to character. Yeah. Always hot temper and always, you know, like uh, I always remind, when I talk about this, I always remind people of uh, Bruce Willis in, uh, what was the name of the movie? Last Action Hero? I'm not sure. That, but there's a scene when he, he, a Tony Scott movie with Bruce Willis, I don't remember the title in English, when he tells the guy, if you touch me again, I will kill you. And yeah. the guy touches him again, and he kills him. And yeah. the guy, and some people tell me, oh, that was out of place. No, he's been telling the fucking guy for 15 minutes in the same scene if you touch me again i'm gonna kill you how is that out of character yes no it's right there it's right there on the page yeah no and she, she's always been hawkish she's always and i and i don't think that there's anything i don't think there's anything unfeminine about it i don't think i think sh mara is a badass who is very comfortable with her power fuck yeah. you yeah you know? absolutely so. and uh, the, the, his other question was uh uh, if you have continued with Aquaman, what future would you like Andy uh, Andy, Cur Andy Curry to have? Um, I actually wanted to do something with Andy where I wanted Andy and Lernea 
to become, I, I wanted to do a thing with them where Andy and Lernea became one hero, mm -hmm. where the two of them together would become like, like they would have one code name, you know? Like, so they were separately, they were Andy and Lernea, but like when it was like superhero time, they acted as one. And the, the idea was that Andy is this like incredibly fearless creature because of having been raised by gods and superheroes. She is like just completely without any sense of danger. Like yeah. whatever it is, she is going for it, right? And then Lernea was abandoned at the bottom of the ocean and it like is full of fear yeah. and um uh, but is lonely, right? Like that like she was alone in that crevice for years and years and years. So, so Andy provides for her the companionship and the connection to her beingness. And then, and then she provides for Andy this sort of literal shelter. That's why I did the thing where, um, where Lernea became uh, a, a kind of a glove over top of Mara. I was, I wanted to foreshadow that mm -hmm. as the relationship between Lernea and Andy as one hero. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they, they ended up going a different direction with her, um, which is cool. She looks great, but that was, that was what I was working towards. Okay. Uh, Chronicles Atlantis, another Aquaman fan. How did you end up writing Aquaman? How was the process? Uh, uh, Brian Bendis, who is a dear friend of our family, uh, was very ill and he was in the hospital. And uh, Brian uh, likes to talk about two things. He likes to talk about his work and he likes to talk about his family. And we had kind of talked about all of the family that we could talk about. And so we started talking about work. And, um, and it was a bunch of us and we were like kind of play casting what, like, well, you know, he he was just moving over to DC and it was like, you know, we could get the band back together. We could all work at DC, you know, who would you work on? And, you know, and, and I think they were like, you could do Supergirl. And I was like, yeah, I built my career on Carol Danvers. I should definitely go do Kara oh, Danvers. <laughs> uh, who is another like overpowered blonde. That's a great idea. You know, like, no, I'm not doing that. And you, then, you, just tattooed it, you just tattooed it in your, in your, for, in your forehead. He's like, no. Yeah, that's a <laughs> terrible idea. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then it was like, well, how about that girl? And it was like, I don't know. Um, you know, and then I think Brian was like, well, you wouldn't want to do Aquaman, would you? And I was like, no. And then my husband, who is always very smart about these things was like, hold on. <laughs> Two things I would like to propose. One, Mr. Jason Momoa. Two, I don't know what you on Aquaman looks like. That is weird and I'm into it. Uh, and I think there was just something about that that was like, it's not safe, it's not obvious, I'm interested. Yeah. You know? And then I started doing some research and was like, oh no, there are I I have opinions. I have theories. I have I care. So mm -hmm. if I care, I can do it. We was uh, was it um which which Aquaman past stories were the ones you researched most? I, I just said Jeff's before Jones. Also, Peter David, or that era was uh, was not something. Yeah, really no, um, um, Peter David was really uh, uh, Atlantis Chronicles is so important yeah. to yeah. that character that there's no way you can not. Uh, that's vital reading, um, but uh, uh, but most pertinent to my run would be John's run. Mm -hmm. Okay, Juan Sandia says hello from Brussels. Nice, nice to see you and meet you here, even if it's virtually. Hello. Jerai Garcia Celades. Hi, Kelly. Love your work. What does it mean to you seeing the icon that Karen Danvers has become? How do you come up with such new spin on popular characters like her or Aquaman when you write them? Because she's a genius. <laughs> anyway. I think it's just that thing where you just sort of go back, like we were talking about, you go back to what are the fundamentals of this character and then where, what, 
you know, you have to commit, you have to make a decision that like, this is what I am identifying as the core of this character. This is what I am identifying as the fundamentals and then kind of build out from there in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it's risky, you know, and you just, that's okay. You know, it, your, your job as an artist is to not, not to go where you're safe. Yeah. That's not what artists are for. That's also, that's the, honestly, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I knew what you were doing Aquaman, I also thought, oh, this must be challenging and that's why she's doing it. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. It's totally weird. It was like, there's nothing obvious about that casting, right? Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And that's why I love that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, break, break your mind. go. I want to acknowledge something that I fucked up in Aquaman, by the way, which is the tattoos. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a lot of conversation early on about how we were going to, you know, we were launching the same month as the movie. So yeah. how do we acknowledge and sort of fold in the spirit of the Momoa Aquaman, but also stay true to classic comic book Aquaman, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a very difficult line to walk. And so, you know, like I wanted longer hair. I wanted the sort of more, like more metal thing mm -hmm. about our, I was trying to give him a little bit more swagger, but also like stay true to some of what we already knew about him and like the fundamentals of uh, his story and, 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 you know, and, it, and one of the executives said, do you want to do the tattoos? And, uh, and I was like, sure. I, you know, I hadn't, and then, and it was like, well, that's going to be complicated because they are cultural. Yeah. Um, and my solution was to have them be gifted to him by a cultural figure and to bring in to be very deliberate about bringing in these other um, uh, uh, ocean gods from parts of the world that are not usually represented in mm -hmm. our comics, right? So we use a lot of uh, we use a lot of white Western uh, mythologies. We use a lot of of Greek mythologies, and we use a lot of of uh, uh, Norse mythologies, and yep. you could are you whether Greek is white or not, but, um, but like, like classically Western, but yeah. so like, all right, we're going to bring in South American mythologies and we're going to bring in, um, uh, uh, Asian mythologies and South Asian mythologies and, and, and African mythologies and acknowledge the fact that the ocean is universal. Right. And like, um, but intent is different than impact and in allowing for him to have those tattoos, best of intentions aside, I shouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. And if I'd said no, they wouldn't, you know, they would have been like, okay, fine. Um, so that is a thing that I regret. That is a thing that I fucked up and I don't want it to be I don't want my silence to be read as defensive. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I, I would like to model the ability to be like, no, that was a mistake. I made a mistake and I'm sorry for the mistake. And I will correct that going forward. I will not make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so anyway, I want to just take a minute to do that. No, no, no. That honors you as a person, as a human being, to own up to your mistakes, and I respect you even more because of that. So, thank you so much, uh, Blake Rival. Which comic are you most proud of, and why? That's like picking a favorite yep. child. You yep. can't do that. Um, um, you know. Um, also, because. Every comic is a relationship for me. I couldn't pick a favorite relationship. My relationship to Emma is so important. She's my sister, you know. Um, uh, my relationship to Phil, my relationship to David, my relationship to Val, they're all family, you know. 
um, uh, and 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 even like uh, uh, in the in the in the corporate work where it's sort of like you, you know their their relationships that are like arranged marriages, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they still become so important to you, and it's and it's so personal, and I just could never. I could never do that. Guys, I always tell you to never ask this because it's really, really difficult and you put them in a difficult spot. So no, 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 don't do that. Uh, Pedro del Mercader, hello everyone. Thank you for your work. Big fan of Pretty Deadly. It saddens me that poetic comics are not that common. How is your approach for the writing of that book? How did you structure that? So um, Pretty Deadly is the most conversational uh, comic that we do. So I have a sense going in of what that, what the arc is about. So it'll be five arcs in total. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so in one, so it's a story about stories, pretty deadly, right? And, um, <clears throat> and it's told on three levels. There's the, the, the overarching bunny butterfly story. Um, and then there are the, um the immortals and then there are the mortals so there's uh bunny and butterfly and then there are the reapers and um and then uh and then there's sarah and her family um and so i so like the first one and we're, we we also because it's a story about stories we talk about like comic genres you know so like the first one is a weird western right it's like mm -hmm. that particular genre. Um, the second one is a war comic. Um, the third one is a noir murder mystery. Um, uh, the fourth one will be a romance comic. It's a love story. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fifth one right now, I'm just referring to it as a literary comic. And I that could change. That's mm -hmm. the last one. It's down the line a little bit. Um, and it also talks about the American West and like the mythology of Americans. And there's a, there's a lot going on with it, but each volume is structured around a question. The first one is why death? The second one is, um, well, it's interesting because I thought the second one uh, was either why war or why fear, but in the end, I think the second one ended up being why luck or why chance. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the third one um, <clears throat> was why art. The fourth will be why love and the last will be why hope. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, we, we do that book a scene at a time. So I write a scene, it goes to Emma, she pencils it, she sends back the pencils while she's inking, I write the next scene. And that allows for that conversation. Also the key on Pretty, pretty Deadly uh, is just letting Emma be Emma, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but I've known her, I've known her from our, our hometown. We are from the same hometown oh, since yeah. she was, I, Jesus, she's gonna kill me. I, maybe she was 12 or 13. Wow. When she was a really small kid, hugely incredibly talented already, doing fan scenes already. Yeah. So love her as a little sister, as you said. I, but as I said, with Emma, I always said, let just let Emma be Emma. And, yeah. <laughs> and you'll be fine. I never, ever. So I when I script for her, I script, I don't do panel breakdowns. Um, I do beat breakdowns, and it's just prose and dialogue. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and she does all of the, the paneling. And I've never written a page for her that she did not add panels to. Like she will, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you thought it was busy at 12 panels? We're gonna make it 16 and it's gonna be perfect. You know, like she's just amazing. I'm not, I'm not, I, I could, I could fake and surprise, but I'm not. So let's move on. Miguel Angel Montes de Oca, uh, good morning, incredible guests. Question, aside from talent and work, how did you get the chance to work in so diverse titles and for diverse companies? Well, this talent and work, but. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny because uh, you tend to, I 
tend to think that everything I do is so wildly different, right? And like, like, oh, my range is very broad, you know? And then, <clears throat> and then uh, some academic will write a paper about how, no, really, uh, every one of the stories that I'm involved in talks about the same shit from different angles, you know? And you're like, oh, fuck, you're right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, like, I don't know, it just works out that way. And then, like, you know, after a while, after you've done some work and people have read your work, people start coming to you and offering you chances to do other work. And that's just kind of work begets work, you know? Yeah, that's absolutely. So you you prove yourself and that opens new doors. That's just the logical way things work, right? Yep. Uh, Pedro Mercader, it makes me smile to recognize you in the cameo you did in the Captain Marvel movie. How do you remember how do you rem the, sorry, the, how do you remember shooting that scene? Um like I I just you know it was it was a wonderful experience. The whole Captain Marvel movie experience was tremendous. I, you know, when they first, I, I went into it with a little bit of a bad attitude. I went into it um, thinking, oh, they're not going to listen to me. They just want to put my name on it. So they're going to, you know, throw me a bone just so they can put my name on it. And they're, but like, ha ha, I'm going to tell them what I think anyway. And like, you know what? I was a dick. They were wonderful. They absolutely listened to me. They included me in everything. I felt very much a part of the team. I spent a lot of time with everyone. It was an incredible experience. Also, I am not in the habit of trusting Hollywood people to have the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. And I will say they really wanted not just to make a good movie, but to say something, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it was cool. It was great. Are you sure though that was real Hollywood and not Hollywood in some other country, like Argentina or something like that? I don't know. Maybe they were just putting me on. Uh, it might have been like a whole act. It was a very expensive con for just me, though. Like, <laughs> Okay. Uh, Blake Rival asked you a really fun question. Have you used or written Matt into any of your comics? And if so, which ones? Oh, that face says, I cannot answer that. <laughs> there are elements of Matt in Aquaman, I will say. Um, Let me put my face on, hmm, interesting. <laughs> uh, and that's it, and that's all you're gonna get, Blake. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Benjamin Flores, big heart love from PDX. He sends you. Oh, hey, neighbor. Uh, let me see. Jack Howell tells you, what is your favorite part about being a well-known and respected comic creator? And what you could recommend in a way of pushing yourself out there enough to get your work going? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Break that down again for me. No worries. What is your favorite part about being a well-known and respected comic creator? And what could you recommend in a way of pushing yourself out there enough to get your work going? I guess he means his career. Okay. I mean, I mean like the, my favorite thing about... Like, it, I, 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 I like having job security. I like that, like, having a sense that, like, I, I'm not... It's not going to be impossible for me to get the next book, you know, like that's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then what do you do? I mean, like the, the best, like, here's the thing, you guys, like the, the advice that I'm going to give you, it's not a trick. It's not like there's no secret to it. Bust your ass. Yeah. Show up. Do the work, be vulnerable, write things that feel true, write things that are, the more personal it is, the more specific it is, the more universal it is. I know that doesn't make sense, but that's the way it works. Um, 
make art, learn your craft, put the time in. That's it. Yeah. Everything else is outside of your control. Absolutely. Yes, there's marketing shit you can do. Do that when you have the opportunity to do it. I can't give you advice on that because it's always changing. The way I did it for the last book isn't the way I can do it for the next book. Also, I hate it. Um, I don't hate interacting with people. I love interacting with people. I'm a very social person. I like community building. I don't like having to market a book I haven't written yet. That's the worst thing in the world. It feels like, like I start doing interviews as soon as I get hired and it's like, what? I haven't written anything yet. Like all I can talk to you about is my pitch. It feels like, like you like you're painting. Yeah. And then they, they keep tapping you on the shoulder. What's the painting about? And like, well, right now it's about yellow, you know, like, I don't know. I'm not going to know until it's over. And then at that point, I don't sell it anymore. So, you know, the way that serialized comics work is very weird because like, it's like, if you write a novel, you, by the time you have to do marketing for it, you know what it's about, yeah. you know, like it's done. We have to market it before it's even written. It's very strange. Well, you get, it has to be f to feel for you. I am not going to say fake, but it doesn't feel real. Because no. you can't feel real because you haven't fucking written it. You you are just starting to think about it or getting into you know in front of that dreaded blank yes. page, the horror of the blank page, page one blank page, and they're asking you, oh, what's the story about? Yeah, and like, well, I can tell you plot elements that I pitched. I might change them when I get in there, <laughs> but um, I like. The, you know, the most honest stuff I can talk about is like my feelings about the character and my feelings about the collaborator. Uh -huh. So I try to focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and then also like in comics, you get into the thing too, where you're like, a project gets announced and it never comes out, you know? And that's like, there's a lot of really complicated reasons why that happens. Yeah. But uh, it ends up being such a problem, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, absolutely. And as a tip, Jack, as I always say to people when they're trying about pushing your career, etc., I always repeat this. Editors love people who finish things. Yeah. So show stuff that's finished. And you have a lot of places to show them now on the internet, fancy, whatever. There's a lot of, a yeah. lot more than it was 10, 15 years ago. So just finish things, show them finished. Because for an artist, if you're a writer, and I assume you're, you're a writer, Jack, uh, as an artist, you can show three pages, four pages, and they can look at them in five minutes, three minutes. Yeah. If you're showing a script, they have to read it, and they don't have the time. So show them something that is finished and publish any possible way you can, and yeah. then they'll, they'll read it. Give them yeah. the chance. Make it easy for them, because if you don't, I'm sorry, they just they just don't have time to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, And um, I have seen some, uh, like, people giving us – samples of comics that were not super polished, great looking comics, but we were able to read them and see, oh no, there's thought process happening here. There's storytelling happening here. There's real potential here. Even though this, pro this particular product doesn't look great, that's fine. We can fix that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Let me see uh, what, T.S. says, what are your thoughts on mixed media comics versus a straight drawing? Cool. Yeah, I mean, I like art. I, I don't, I you know what I like? I like black and white ink comics. I like colored, highly produced comics. I like painted comics. I like mixed media comics. I don't love uh fumetti mm -hmm. i don't love like picture like just photograph comics that's yeah. that's not my shit but what we, what we call what we call photo novels yeah that's mm -hmm. that's the only i mean there are things about them that i like the cheesiness you know <laughs> okay. I, I i like them sort of ironically but i don't like them as an art form 
because I feel like they it works against all of the strengths of comics. Yeah, I, I used to call them. You know what a telenovela is, right? Yeah. I, I call them the telenovelas of comics. Yeah, yeah. And I don't uh, like them either. So. <laughs> but you know, but yeah, I mean, I I like comics made out of stick figures. Mm. I like comics that are highly rendered. I like comics. What you know, I I what is your art? That's fine. Yeah. Do it. Okay. TS also says, "Oh my God, Jess, Facebook Marketplace has been helping me with my thrift store obsession." <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I'm 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 uh, about to put some stuff up on Poshmark. I'm like, yeah. Mm, interesting. Daniel Badosa tells you, hi, Mrs. Deconic, love, pretty, deadly, pure poetry and storytelling. My question is, what are some of the books or comics that influenced you the most in terms of your narrative style and themes? I mean, I, th I think incredibly obviously Sandman, like, duh. Um, and uh, Uh, you know, and also, I'm mean, like a, a great lover of all mythology, Greek theater, uh, uh, Aeschylus and Euripides. Um, I mean, as ridiculous as that sounds, uh, Shakespeare. Um, you know, again, I come from theater. You can see it in my work. It's not, I, I, I have a, an education that's heavy into Western classics, uh, like, like classicism. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 and, and it's, it's there. Um, um, but you know, I also have a fondness for I mean, it's theater of the absurd, and you know, there's a uh, there's a lot of there's a a lot more theatrical in, influence on my work than than there is comics influence on my work. I think. Mm -hmm. Carlos Ramos says, uh, "I found the abolishing of Atlantis monarchy really interesting, but I sort of thought, what, was there a dialogue?" with uh, quotes, I guess, Tanehishi quotes, about changing the structure of Wakanda, other fantasy kingdom in his BP run. I guess he's asking if you guys talked about doing the same thing in Black Panther and Aquaman. I no, but I think he, he and I, we're friends and have the same... Uh, ethical problems with, you know, like, uh, I, like, I just, I don't understand how, how you could, like, this will piss some people off, but like, I don't believe in ethical billionaires and that's why I can't really write Batman is like, it just, if I wrote Batman, he'd have to give away his fucking money and nobody wants to read that book. So, you know, um, sorry, I can't, I'm just a bad fit for that. Um, uh, but I, I couldn't, you know, there was a moment in, this is, we talk about like how you discover things in the writing. There was a moment in writing um, uh, Aquaman where Mara, you know, we had, I, I wanted to talk about economic inequality mm -hmm. and, um, and the, and there was just th this moment when Mara, you know, says how in, in the most advanced society, like Atlantis was the most advanced society, uh, uh, in the world, how are we, do we still have people living in poverty? Why? And then, uh, you know, and then the character says, so that, you, you know, so you can live in luxury. And she's like, is that true? And Volko's like, well, it's not that simple, but like from that moment, when that was said to Mara, there's no way she doesn't act on that and she stays a hero. Like if she can live with that, she's not a hero. No, absolutely not. About living with that reality, no. you know? 
So, so there was, there was no choice but to do it. So it was not a conversation uh, that we had, but I, I don't think either one of us being the people that we are, and I'm, believe me, not comparing myself uh, uh, in, in, in the sense of accomplishment or, uh, uh, influence or anything like that. But we are, are, we, we've had some conversations about our particular intersections, you mm -hmm. know, and like his discomfort around the idea of, uh, like, m you know, met what men calling themselves feminists, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and like, and, and my, and I have asserted that I think that's wildly important, be, you know, and in the same way that like, you know, I serve on the board of the Urban League here in Portland, right? And every time as a white woman, I go to the Urban League offices, I feel like an interloper. I feel like I shouldn't be in this space. This is a safe space for not me. You know, but I also recognize that I have a kind of privilege that I have a responsibility to leverage and I need to be there to find out from the people who need me to leverage it, what to do. So I go, I get my marching orders and I go do it, mm -hmm. right? And I need dudes to do the same. And it's, it's a, it's it's complicated and it's uncomfortable and it's not safe and we're it's not our job to be safe you know yeah. That's not what artists are supposed to do well if you are safe in art don't do art yeah <laughs> just don't because it's not art has to be risky it has to be challenging at all times yeah uh kame09 when do you think parisian white will come out well what? I don't know. I mean, um, I think it's like four years ago now that we announced that book. Um, and uh, Bill and I spoke last week about it. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I still love the book. I still, I love Bill very much. And I don't, it's, it's difficult to talk about because um, there are a lot of very good reasons why it hasn't come out. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and like, th there's just my, my relationship with, with my friend is far more important to me than whether or not that book ever comes out. So I hope it does. I know we both care about it very much. The work that has been done on it is absolutely incredible and it is a great privilege to work with him. And if it never comes out, I will still be glad to have done it. I will still love and adore Bill Sienkiewicz, who is one of the greatest artists working in our industry. And if not, you can also, you, you can do big numbers part two, you know, you publish a couple <laughs> issues and then, and then we make fun of Bill forever because he deserves it. And uh, um, love is my, Bill is one of my best friends. I love him, but oh my God, it would be so much fun to like, Bill, you don't want to repeat that, right? Yes. You know, but, but like you know, there's stuff. There's stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he just moved. He just moved, so he was busy moving. Yes. Aside of many other things. Okay, just Jack Howell tells you. Just a comment. I absolutely loved your relationship with Mister Fraction. I don't have any other words than to say than how great I think you two are. Much love and respect, Mama Shark. Aww, I love you too, baby glow shark. That was, that was nice. That was nice. I love you when you're nice with my guests. Um, Son of Baldwin says, Robert Jones Jr. says, I love this conversation. I love Kelly Sue the Conic's mind. Um, also, uh, oh my God. Uh, the, the, hold on, because I know Son of Baldwin by his name, Son of Baldwin, which is not, oddly enough, 
his actual name. No, it's uh, Robert, Robert Jones Jr. Yes, Robert Jones Jr. And he has a new novel called The Prophets, I believe, wow. Wow. that I am dying to read. And uh, yes, The Prophets, Robert Jones Jr. Um, and uh, it has been getting phenomenal reviews. And uh, Dude is smart and delightful. And I think we should all support him and pick up that book. Um, so I'm super looking forward to it. I didn't know about this. Just follow what Kelly said. Because if yeah. you don't, she knows where you live. That's right. She will chase you. And she That's will right. make you pay. And if she doesn't, I will for her. There we go. You've been warned. Anyway, let's go. And Robert, uh, good job with your novel. And I want to read it too. Now that Ke Kelly Sus has mentioned it, I didn't know about it. Now I'm interested. Uh, Camus09 says, you have worked with a, a lot with an awesome Galician artist, and Marios. Have you ever thought about visiting Galicia? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I have. Um, uh, I get... Every time Emma and I spend some time together, uh, uh, I, I always like, oh, I want to, you know, she'll tell me, I, I know very little about Spain and she'll tell me about like uh, uh, the, the different parts of Spain and that um, she, the, 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 it's, it's a, like a fishing area that's that's very much in the northern coast. Is that correct? It's the end, it's the end, of, the, it's the end of the world. The Romans call it Finisterre which means the, literally the end of the world. They thought the world ended in Galicia because it's the most Western part of Europe. So the closest part you have is America. Yeah. So they thought the world ended there and you could only go north. That's why the, the Celts came from Galicia all north and then they they went to Ireland and Scotland. All right. So yes, it's all the, the, our hometown because as you know, Emma and I have the same hometown. It's literally a peninsula in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You walk in the beach like three feet and you and the water is like here. Yeah. Well, I'm I very much would like to go. Um, so um I I would love that. Uh and I you know, and and uh I only got to spend a very little, a very short time in Barcelona. Barcelona, There's, yeah, for the show. Yeah. And and, and Bar my it was a, a very brief experience in Barcelona, but Barcelona may have been the first city to challenge Rome as my favorite city. I was like, ooh, I could really like it here. I've spent a lot, a lot of time in Rome. I haven't spent enough time in Barcelona to, to like make that a fair comparison. But yeah, um, but yeah I, I- We have a thing here in Barcelona. We win because we are a lot less crazy in terms of the traffic and all that, you know? You don't want to kill yourself every five seconds. That's, and I love Rome, but believe me, like, would I live in Rome? No, no, <laughs> no. But if you ask me about New York, I'm sorry, I would say the same thing. Would I live in New York? No, shit, no. <laughs> Just too much. Uh, let me see. Son of Baldwin, Robert Jones Jr. answers to what we said before. Yes, Lois Lane. Yes. And yeah. let me ask you this, and tell me if you agree. I think Lois Lane is the most powerful character in the whole DC universe. She she's not a hero, but she's the most powerful because of her connections. She knows everybody. Everybody fears her because yeah. she knows everybody. She, she, she is, has the info. She, she is the one, she just means the most to me because her superpower is she's a truth teller. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. and uh, and you know, and I I think particularly today when the truth is under such assault, mm -hmm. um, uh, our everybody likes to not everybody, too many people like to deride and even now threaten journalists, and journalists are heroes yes. and the ones who at who really take their job seriously and adhere to the tenets of professional journalism. Just mm -hmm. because you can type doesn't mean you can write. Just because you can lie doesn't mean you can act. You know, uh, uh, and just because you can like run a blog doesn't mean you're a journalist. Mm -hmm. But the real journalists are doing such a, an, 
And look, there are some real journalists who have blog. It, it's about integrity and standards and truth telling and fearlessness, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and those things are are so much more important today. I don't know that they've ever not been important, but they've never been so attacked. I don't think. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look, if if the real journalists hadn't uh, reacted and fought Trump, yeah. Let's be honest. Without the journalist, I he could have won. Well, and the thing too is, it's they're not even attacking Trump. That's not their job. No, no, no. I didn't say attack Trump. I said uh, if they were didn't react to Trump, if they were like, wait, this guy wants to install yeah. a dictatorship. He wants to break the law at any possible time. He wants to con everybody. If the journalist hadn't said, wait a minute, we have to fight back, not Trump, but we have to fight that possible things that's going to happen if we don't defend democracy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of there's an interesting parallel in that the way that we were talking about, uh, uh, like story and truth telling and the, the sort of things that are more true than true, like exaggerate, you know, and like so as storytellers, we tell truths by telling lies, but. Journalists tell truths by telling truths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Pablo de la Rubia asked you a question. Did you did you write Captain Marvel with your safe with yourself in mind? No. No. She's very different than me. I mean, like all of every character you write is a little bit you. Yeah. But um, but you know, my, my, I don't have that wound i don't have i'm not as driven as she is i'm much more uh i'm much more whimsical than mm -hmm. carol is carol's very uh no we're not the same person at all okay uh, uh david Aja. hola david in uh, david lopez hola david again Remind me of the title of the movie I forgot before, The Last Boy Scout. That's the Bruce Willis movie I was talking about. Uh, Carlo uh, Ram three excellent Davids. Yes. Two, two of the greatest Davids ever. Uh, and I mean you guys, not me. Carlos Ramos, granting Final Crisis, wrote Arthur returning in sort of his king, of this King Arthur back from Avalon. How much of that was in your mind? Um, the, the... Not. Oh, uh, not. Um, uh, uh, I, be, I had been given from the beginning, um, the directive that they didn't want, they had done a lot of time in Atlantis. They did not want Atlantis stories. They wanted, uh, Arthur in our world stories. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you can't, the Camelot stuff doesn't, I mean, obviously his name is Arthur, like there's a Camelot reference there, duh. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't function as a story engine for land stories, which I had been told you are doing land stories. That mm -hmm. was not negotiable. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I kind of cheated by doing some Atlantis stories by using Mara. Uh -huh. um, but uh, but yeah, his. I also I just felt like the the whole like heavy is the head that wears the crown thing had been done to fucking death with him, and uh, and it's hard to cheer for a character who's bummed all the fucking time, right? Like mm -hmm. he's this he's kind of like a Superman character. He's a blue skies character, so you don't want him to be like, <clears throat> you know, like fuck. I don't need that. Yeah. Absolutely. HGD tells you, man, this woman is so stylish. That's why I love Captain Marvel so much. Now I understand it. Oh, yay. And David Lopez says, telenovelas are great. Hey, I didn't say anything bad about them. I just compared both things. No, they are. You know, I like, I love soap operas. I do, I do. So. And like... David Aja says, Doom Lord for the win. And for as you will read this out of context, Doom Lord is an 80s British fumetti calling Spain exterminious. Anyway, I love you, Kelly. You know that. Big, big hug. Aw, I love you too, David. 
I don't know what Doom Lord is, David, but I believe you. <laughs> so, uh, Son of Baldwin, Robert Jones Jr. says thank you because of what we said about the novel. Yes, uh, the prophets. Everybody go pick it up. And um, um, Son of Baldwin is obviously a, a reference to, to James Baldwin. And um, uh, But that's that, that thing that happens when uh, when you have a relationship with a relationship with, you, you know someone online, like you, you, you know them, like that's his name to me. His name is Robert Jones Jr. I don't know him by that name. I know him as the progeny of James Baldwin. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, like there was a reason that like I, I still refer to my husband as Fraction because I met him online as Fraction. You know? mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I met my wife online too, just you know, in the old IRC in a in a yeah. comic corner. So 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 there was some relationship there. Uh, yeah. I uh, want to also make sure that like David understands that. Like I know is as much of a like quintessential like cartoonist and reductive storyteller that David Aha is that he can make something more essential, more complicated and more real by making it simpler. Yeah. Like that's a fucking talent. That man's a goddamn genius and i know i'm throwing that word around here a lot but i know a lot of geniuses i'm very lucky in that way but um uh anyway like the but so the 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 fumetti which are like in now the way i know the word fumetti and maybe that's uh maybe that's um uh not the correct, but I know it as being like comics that are made from still photographs. Yeah, photo photonovelas, photonovelas. Yes, that's why I used that word before. We call them yeah. photonovelas, photonovels in Spain. So I, I guess we're talking about the same. But yeah, David yeah. says yes. Esther Minion says scared the shit out of me. They're talking about <laughs> telenovelas now, but I meant novelas, Telemundo stuff. You just have to find the one that fits you. Uh, yeah. So, so Carlos, I'm sure. Carlos yeah. Ramos says Brazil has the best telenovelas. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And David Aja tells you I'm crying. Well, that, David, right. So, so right. She's right. It's what he said is absolutely true. You're a genius. David Lopez also is. You both are geniuses. So that's, let's say it as it is. If you don't like it that we say it, I'm sorry, we're going to say it. You're fucking geniuses. And she is too. Uh, but, 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 uh, son of Baldwin asks you, of the, of the Baldwin lineages of all <laughs> yes, yes, Baldwin's, yes. Uh, they say that of all that royalty of Baldwin's, we can say that. Uh, he says, are you as pumped about Historia as we are? Yes. Um, Y'all... Phil, Phil, Phil is watching. Just say yes. Okay. No. <laughs> y'all don't know. Y'all don't... Y'all ain't ready. Okay? I'm just saying. It, it, this... Okay. First of all, um, I can't look, you have to understand. Um, I, I've been so, so incredibly blessed in my career, so incredibly lucky. And there are, um, there are these people in my life, these creative partners that I have had the opportunity to have and, and to work with and to have like these incredible friendships with. Um, and when it's hard for me to talk about them in a way that isn't like full of superlatives. And because there are so many of them, it just sort of begins to sound like bullshit, right? But the truth is they are all extraordinary human beings and they are all artists in the most essential definition of that term, mm -hmm. right? They are people who are trying to find and communicate truths and to grow in their ability to understand these truths, to explore these truths, to challenge these truths, and to use these truths as mirrors for the rest of us 
to see ourselves and to understand our relationships to ourselves and to one another, mm -hmm. right? And this is how we grow as human beings. And it's so necessary. Like we, we never really escape our own minds. We really never completely escape our own perspectives, but art is the closest we can come. It's the closest we come to having the, the real empathy for each other. And that's how we transcend ourselves. And that's how we become a real community. And that's how we elevate everything, mm -hmm. right? And it just sounds so ridiculous, especially when you're like, dude, you're talking about comic books. But no, it's, I'm talking about stories. Yeah. Right? I'm talking about the most basic elements of the human mind. Um, and so when I tell you that, you know, Emma is this wildly important person in my life, you know, um, when I tell you that Emma lives in my head in a place, you know, uh, when I tell you that, uh, uh, you know, that Valentine's children are very important to me, you know, that I, I, want to know how they're growing and developing that you know that in in it, when i tell you that the affection with which i think about phil and like he makes jokes about like like because the book has taken so long to come out you know that that like it's I don't care. I, I don't care. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. And the conversations that we have had in the construction of this book and the way that he has understood and had my back and like expanded on every notion that I have had, like it, it's, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. And when you see this shit, you will understand immediately. Um, it, it's unfucking believable. Um, and like, okay, and so the the idea of Historia. If anybody doesn't know what Historia is, um, so the idea of Historia was, and I don't know why I'm getting notifications. I think notifications are supposed to be turned off, but. Um, uh, uh, the idea of Historia was I was bummed when I saw the Wonder Woman movie that the Amazons were not what I wanted them to be. Like they were great, but like, but like the Amazons got their asses kicked by like they prepared for war for a thousand years for, you know, like, oh, we're preparing for war, 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 war. Like we saw no evidence of any other culture that they had except like preparing for war. Mm -hmm. And then, and then like a boat full of tired Eastern European sailors accidentally finds fucking Paradise Island and slaughters these demi goddesses who've been preparing for war for that, like what? No, like. It, Especially because the one, the first one who died was uh, the aunt, Diana's aunt, who's supposed to be the master of everybody there in that island to to uh, to do war. You know, Artemis is supposed to be their best warrior, and she's the first one who dies, which is like what, what, what? Yeah, and and and, and it was just like, and like, why? Uh, and then it, it was like, I guess because bullets, but like in a thousand years, we didn't think of bullets and like also bullets and bracelets. So, so maybe we did like, it was just this whole thing was like, what the fuck? Um, and, 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 you know, and then there, and then they were like, oh, Hey, you guys have been preparing for war for a thousand years. There's a war, there's a world war. You should come. And then the Amazons are like, no, we out, you know? And it was like, what? And like supposedly that was to protect Diana, but then like Diana's like, nah, y'all, I'm going to the fucking war. You know, and like it was just like the whole thing. It was like, 
I don't understand. Yeah, I remember talking to Phil about that, you know, about that moment when Diana says, she's discovered, you know, and she says to her mom, mom, whatever you do, I'm leaving. And yeah. I was telling to Phil, that contradicts the whole fucking 30 minutes before that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I stopped believing in anything they say because it's, it was everything to protect Diana. And then Diana says, bye, I'm leaving. And she just leaves. Yeah. And, and like, I love Gal Gadot in that role. Yeah. I love that that movie was successful. I love that it meant a lot to a lot of people. And I don't want to take anything away from anybody. Absolutely. But it bothered me. And so... So uh, when I got a call from DC and they were like, would you like to do a black label thing? I was like, Amazons, you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and then, and so then it was like, all right. So I, I actually, I, I don't know if it'll end up, I pitched huge. I pitched nine 64 page chapters. So if we finish this thing, uh, it'll be the same size as from hell. Like, um, but it's, it ta it's the story of the Amazons from the perspective of the Amazons. Mm -hmm. So the idea is history is written by the victors in the war between the Amazons and the world of men, the Amazons lost. So the history that you think you know of the Amazons is not their history, and this is their history. And so it begins from the moment that the goddesses conceive of the Amazons, and it goes through three three-part books, nine 64-page chapters, and ends with uh, Steve Trevor landing on the beach. So it ends where Wonder Woman's story traditionally begins. And I wanted it to be a Homerian epic with a woman at the center. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what it is. And Phil was like, oh, I'm sorry, did you say epic? I'm gonna fucking give you epic. Um, <laughs> you just did feel perfectly well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just it's it is phenomenal and he has become family and uh yeah and it and it's i love my life i'm very lucky to get to do what i do did you know that phil came all the way from new york to our wedding oh i did not that's wonderful all the way from new york to be in our wedding that's yeah. how family he is for us too he's like ah, love you phil well love you, you, know, phil. Love you joe also, Joe, I don't remember. I don't forget you. David, I, I, you don't, you and I don't know each other well. We've had some correspondence yeah. professionally, but we don't know each other well. But um, both uh, David Lopez and Phil messaged me and told me that they were looking forward to this conversation because they both said you were like asked really great questions and were very animated, and this would be a lot of fun. And I was like, oh, good. I didn't know what to expect. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, thank you, Kelly Shoes. Thank you, everybody. I'm yeah. thank you. I'm thankful. Uh, let me see. Uh, Jack Howell tells you know, one question, last question, I swear. When Chip comes over to play, is he the babysitter or is it mad? So I will tell you a story about um, uh, Chip. What? Chip came to a Chip, you know, Chip lives in Canada. But uh -huh. one time, there was one time when he was at our house, and I think it was Chip and Meredith Yayanos, but I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. um, it may have been, I'm not sure. Anyway, it was it was Chip and somebody else, and Tallulah, um, my daughter, my, our youngest, took them into her room. And she was probably four, uh, maybe five at the time. And uh, and they were gone for a really long time. And like, I, I finally went to go check on them and I opened her door and like they had, I'm not kidding you. I'm literally not kidding you. They had on pig masks and flashlights and, and the lights were off. And I was like, okay, I'm out. Whatever is happening here, I don't need to know about it. 
So that was a thing that actually happened. Okay. And we don't want to know more anything else about that. Uh, <laughs> Dave DSG asked you, hello, when will you make a comic of how you met Mr. Fraction? I loved your uh, love story. Uh, how um, I met how how I met Fraction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I sort of did. It's not real, literal, but I did a story for CBGB that was a little bit, at, at least it was the feeling of that time in my life for the, mm -hmm. the, the CBGB uh, anthology. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos Ramos, would you ever want to work as sort of a head of publishing line, kind of what like Hickman is doing in the ex office? I don't know. Um, kind of, I mean, I have a, uh, I have, I'm trying to decide whether to talk about this or not. I, ha I have a low key thing. Um, Valentine Delandro, Andrew Iden, and Matt and I have a side company um, that we have not made much, not made a big deal out of, but we're, um, we do nonfiction comics for schools and institutions. Um, like we did a, a comic about voting rights for the New York public school system. And we've done some other stuff. And um, there's, we would like to get to the point where we're not doing all of the writing, where we're able to kind of direct and oversee. So, so yes, but not quite in that way, not quite like, not not at a DC or a Marvel, like show running a particular mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. So we've been at this, just so you know, uh, two hours and 30 minutes so so. <laughs> so oh you should Sorry. go back, I think you should go back to your life, maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm chatty. I'm very chatty. No, 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 no. I love it. I love it. I just want you to go back to your life. I feel bad for you, honestly. Um, one last, and I let you go. As okay. They, as they say. Um, right. Is there any story that's been nagging you for a long time that for whatever reason you haven't been able to tell, but you keep telling yourself, I am not going to retire or die because I don't know if you're ever going to retire. Uh, without telling this story? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a few, but there's this, there's, I'm, I'm trying to write this novel right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and like, I, I have to check in with Greg Rucka once a week with, you know, my progress report just to have some accountability on it. And it's hard because right now my, my, my plate is as full as it's ever been. So trying to make time for something that doesn't have a deadline, you know, is, is, is tough. And like David Lopez and I are trying to develop um, a project of our own as well. That is an interesting thing because I have uh, like the tone of it, I get the tone. I absolutely get the tone. I haven't got the story uh -huh. yet. And I can't find the still place where I can hear it. And I need to find some, I, I just need some stillness so I can mm -hmm. find it. Um, uh, and, I, and I haven't been able to make the stillness. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there's a few things I very much want to do. I want I want to do this novel. I want to do uh, uh, this project with David. I want to finish Bitch Planet and Pretty Deadly. I want, like those are, these things are all very important to me. Um, uh, I want to finish Historia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I keep a list of, what I, I I call it a sweater thread list, um, and I and I, I I want to 
There's a there's also a thing I I want I'm bothered right now by this pervasive theme in both science fiction and fantasy that like we never escape our biology, right? Mm -hmm. That like 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 in the end like what well, in the end of game of thrones what was the lesson the lesson was like oh yeah the crazy ass targaryen lady gonna be the crazy ass targaryen lady like you know scorpion gonna be a scorpion like there's like and and, and you know and for a little while in star wars i felt like we were going to get away from this like oh you know the 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 lineage of the force right yeah. the, um, and then went, nope, nope, turns out Ray totally lineage of the force. Like, you know, and, and, uh, like, I don't, I hate it. I fucking hate it. I hate it because it is not my experience of the world. It is not my experience of people. My experience is people can change and people can absolutely transcend their familial the familiar background of course yeah. yeah you know and 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 even their own background yeah. like people are capable of change people are capable of profound change yeah. um and i feel like when we give up on that we give up on people yes you know and like i just it fucking drives me crazy and it's at the heart of so many of our modern myths yeah. and like you know, like the, just like the, the, the once and future King and the, you know, like just all of this, like, and the, the, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. And I think it, it also like reinforces a lot of our classist caste system shit. And, um, and, and I want, I want to respond like from a place in my gut i want to scream that is not the humanity i know absolutely. absolutely um and i don't know when or how to do that but some point i will i always have carb in my brain even believe it or not it's, and it's completely related to what you just said terminator 2. yeah when sarah connor writes there is no fate we yeah. write ourselves for yeah. me, that was always here. That and Cosmos by Carl Sagan. <laughs> but that's a completely different subject. But it's yeah. always been there. Every time it, somebody talks about fate, I will always say, no, there yeah. is no fate. You do your fate. In, in every, and if anybody else tells you your story is already written out for you and you can just be that way, that's a lie. Yeah, I, I, I like, I... I super love tarot cards. I have like a great fascination with tarot cards, but I don't believe in them or use them or play with them for divination. I don't yeah. like divination. Yeah. I use them, I like them as prompts to like make connections or to help me break stories if I'm stuck, like get me to think about something else or whatever, but like, never divination because if you could divine it then it was set and i don't like that yeah absolutely you know it's, as i always say astrology is very good to create the stories out of it but if you yeah. want facts go change some letters and you'll find something that is called astronomy yeah yeah and anyway uh look one last thing uh, mr dongs tell you wow mama shark has teeth does kelly sue the iconic support the fandom menace probably not I don't know what that. I was going to say I don't know what that is, so I must stay in a way. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, okay, so if, if it's a thing where people harass creators and actors, and then no. Um, uh, and and I've honestly, I've seen like three Star Wars movies. Leave me the fuck alone. I don't really care. I I, I like I um. I don't, I only know about it because of the way that it is 
uh, uh, such a part of our culture. Um, yeah. But I'm a Trek girl. Woo! Start that. There we go. Now we'll, now we'll fight. <laughs> no, and let's say it this way. And if anybody doesn't like what I'm going to say, you can jump on this. Right. Star Wars fans are toxic. Yeah, it's toxic. I, I, that fandom is toxic. It's not. Yeah, it's I, I not, think they're... it's not healthy. It's not healthy. You know, they think they know. They think they tell you how the story has to be, and if you deviate one fraction of a second, not talking about Matt here, <laughs> uh, from from what they think it should be, you are called any kind of name, get threats, whatever. That's toxic. And if you don't realize it's toxic, you have a big problem. Well, like I, I, I. I don't know it very well. It means a lot. It's good for you. It means a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to important people in my life. It mm -hmm. means a lot to uh, Matt. It means a lot to my son. It means a lot to Greg Rucka. Um, and, uh, and I think about when we went to Disney Disney has Star Wars Land now, yeah. right? Yeah. It was a, we were at Disney and my son got to go to Star Wars Land and my husband and like they're like they made their lightsabers and they were like, you know, and it was just like it was the most glorious, pure. It was so wonderful, you know, and like and I have. I can't find any hate in my heart for any of that. That's incredible. Um, and, but, but, but like, I'm also allowed to critique thematic notions that mm -hmm. I don't think are reflective of the world that I live in. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, you know what? I, I think that the, the, I, I can't back you up on the whole Star Wars fans are toxic. Thing. No, no, I don't mean the whole the whole fandom. No, 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 wait, 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 don't kill me, guys. Okay, all right, all right. I but, mean, there's uh, a part, there's a part of that fandom which is the ones that do the things I just told you. Yeah. Are, like a sect, this really toxic. They, there's a part of the fandom of Star Wars that has, has changed over the past few years, especially yeah. with the new movies that have become like a sect, you know, like a cult. Yeah. And you uh, cannot you cannot say you don't like anything or you cannot say anything about story. If you do the most single constructive criticism, you are told the biggest curse names you can imagine. That's the yeah. part I mean, you know. For example, Dave DSD is saying Star Wars fans are like the Snyder Cut fans. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I want to say. No, not all of them. There a lot, I know a lot of Star Wars fans who are healthy as hell and amazing people. But there's a part of them, yes, there's a part of them that are like the Snyder Cut fans. I'm sorry yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there there are, I, I don't know it well. It doesn't enter into my own personal mythology a lot, but it is very important important to our culture. And there are some parts of it that I do find like a bummer. Like I love the idea that Ray was just some kid, mm -hmm. like, you know, and then the fact that they then connected her. And again, I haven't seen those movies. I just know about it. Right. Um, but that they then connected her by birth mm -hmm. to like the lineage of the horse that bugs me. Um, uh, because I was so, I so loved the notion that she was just some kid, you know, because I think, I, I think it's, the just some kids matter so much, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, but at the end of the day, you know. Dobby, clearly you and I could just keep going. Yes. So we're going to have to do this again. Like, yeah. okay. Whenever you want, we, we'll do it. Just, you know, the other side of your equation is, for me, when I, they said on Last Jedi, Gray, you know, is just one kid. I literally said, I can't believe that. Because yeah. since I saw the other movies and I know that the whole nine trilogy, whatever you call it, nineology, is about the lineage of a lineage of this of the Skywalkers. Yeah. For me, when when that was said in Last the Die, I was like, nah, that's bullshit. Yeah. So I, you know, it didn't even enter my head what you just said. 
I didn't thought about it. I haven't thought about it that way until you just mentioned it. For yeah. me, it was just, no, nah, that's not possible. So the other side, I love it now. I love that part of, yeah, everybody can be. But since yeah. it couldn't get in my head because I knew the full the full thing, yeah, it was it wasn't part of the equation, which makes it even more intriguing. I I think it's just such a, it's like such a brave position and so much more real to me. And like and I think that's the appeal of like Miles Morales, right? It's yeah. just the, the like anybody can wear the mask, like yeah. you can be a hero, like yeah. live your ideals. That's it, you know. Absolutely. Like, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, everybody. Everybody can be a hero. It doesn't uh, depend on uh, on the lineage. You know, the biggest heroes are not because they're the son or the daughter of the king. We go back to feudal times. This is not feudal times anymore, guys. You know, yeah. anybody can be a hero. Is and again, we go back to Terminator Two. There's no fate. You carve it for yourself. Yeah, you know, and I think that there, there's, you know, and we can't ignore like the corrupting influence of power. And I think it's actually like far less likely for people who are born into that power to, you know, the Marcus Aureliuses of today are few and far between. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like, oh, I am the son of daughter of the king. Uh, I have a lot of money. Uh, those are the peasants. Yes, I'm going to become a hero to save the peasants that I don't give a shit about. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's a, it, like, um, I, I, there's a, another theme I keep returning to is the, this just like idea of complexity. And I think in the, in this, in, in you know, these, these are, these are all, it's all complicated and we should embrace that and not run from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, complexity is what we said before, art makes you whole and complexity is what makes life livable. Yeah. Because the nuances are what makes us who we are. If we was just carving, you know, in stone with no nuances, it could be by myself. Yeah. And with that, let's cut it here because we could continue until tomorrow. It's so right. Please don't uh, don't cut because I want to say proper thank you to you after we're off the live feed. Okay. But thank you so much, Kelly Sue, for being here. You're amazing. Thank you, David. You and to all of you, thank you so much for being here. Again, don't be assholes. Wear your mask. Take care <laughs> of everybody. See you tomorrow. Os vemos mañana in Spanish and Espanol con Sara JB y de Cinebre Take care. See you all tomorrow. We're out in, I don't know how many fingers, we're in three, 